All right, class, so this is a video that's gonna talk about naming and how we name different chemical compounds. Um, and before we get going with this, the first thing I wanna sort of talk about is the periodic table. So here's my periodic table, and I've sort of highlighted a few things. And, and these things that I've highlighted, you really sort of have to have a, a good grasp of these before you can even begin this naming process. And so what I've highlighted here is the difference between metals and non-metals. So in blue, um, shaded in, I've highlighted my non-metals. So hydrogen is sort of the weird one. It's off here by itself. It is a non-metal. And then if I draw a line, the way I, I remember this is I draw a line from this top corner here, diagonally down, uh, these are all non-metals as well. So these are gonna be all my non-metals. Everything else we would consider to be a metal. So aluminum, you know, germanium, antimony, all of these, right? Sometimes they're called semi-metals, but we can consider all of these to be metals, everything over here, except for hydrogen. And then boron, silicon, arsenic, these are all gonna still be inside of that non-metal box. I've also highlighted my transition metals. So in here in green, in the very middle, I've got my transition metals. And transition metals are gonna behave a little bit differently than our normal sort of group one or group two metals. Group one and group two metals, when they're in, in an ionic compound, they are going to always be plus one charged and plus two charged. So lithium, sodium, potassium, if you find those atoms in a you know ionic compound, they're gonna be in their ionic form and they're gonna have a plus one charge all of the time. Same with group two. These group two metals in an ionic compound will always have a plus two charge. The transition metals, these are gonna vary. Let's take cobalt for instance. Cobalt could have a plus two charge. It could have a plus four charge. We don't necessarily know that, um, it's going to vary, you know, depending on the conditions, depending on what, what uh, compound it's in, okay? So that's the first thing that we, we sort of have to have established and become very comfortable with the difference between a metal and a non-metal and be able to identify that on the periodic table. The next thing I want to talk about is this list of polyatomic ions. So this list of polyatomic ions, um, this is a pretty standard list. I've got my, you know, singly charged anions, doubly charged anions and the different names that they have. So doubly charged means that they've got a two minus charge. Singly charged means that they've got a one minus charge. And these polyatomic ions, they're sort of just like, you know, a group of atoms that has an overall positive or negative charge. And usually they're gonna be negative. Um, and we're gonna treat these a lot like we would treat a non-metal type system, okay? So we'll talk more about these as, we, as they come up. All right, so let's look at the, the first, you know, line here. And we've got this, this other column that says ionic or molecular. And this is really the first thing that we really need to be doing when we're trying to name our different compounds, determining if it's an ionic compound or a molecular compound. And the way that we do that, ionic compounds will be made up of a metal plus a non-metal or polyatomic ion. So, when I look at my periodic table, if I've got a metal, so one of these metals, combined with a non-metal, or hydrogen, um, and a polyatomic ion, then that means that it's gonna be an ionic compound. Molecular is gonna be made up of only non-metals. So if it's made up of only the non-metals, so again, something from over here, maybe it's got hydrogen as well, doesn't have to have hydrogen, but only made up of non-metals, then we're gonna call that a molecular compound. And the naming rules are gonna be different if it's ionic or molecular. So sodium carbonate, right away I'm looking at sodium, so let's just put this right in here. Sodium is a group one metal. And then carbonate, CO3, that's on my list of polyatomic ions. So if I look here, carbonate, it's the first one here. It's got a CO3 with a two minus charge. That's this. So this is gonna be an ionic compound. So we're gonna put an I in there. In terms of naming it, I'm gonna name this just sodium carbonate. And I'm writing sodium because Na is sodium, and then carbonate because CO3 minus, two minus is, is carbonate. And I don't need to, to write anything else. Sodium is always gonna have a plus one charge. We know that because it's in group one. Carbonate is always gonna have a minus two charge. We know that because it's on our list of polyatomic ions. So for my formula, this whole formula overall needs to be neutral. 
So to make this neutral, if my sodium has a plus one charge, I'm gonna need two of those, so Na2. And then my CO3 has a two minus charge, so that will balance out. Let's do the next one. P2O5, this is a molecular compound. So phosphorus here, non-metal, oxygen here, non-metal, molecular compound. Now for molecular compounds, our naming convention is gonna be where we use the di, tri, tetra, so on and so forth. So if it's molecular, then we need to name this as diphosphorus, and then five is penta, but we're gonna write pent oxide. We're gonna leave off that A. If you put that A in there, it's, it's really okay. Um, you know, nitpicky people will say it's, it's incorrect, but you know, if you wrote penta oxide, I, I think that that's fine. Uh, technically though, we're gonna drop that A and write penta oxide. Um, the next one, NH3. So you might recognize NH3 as ammonia, um, and that's fine, that's a totally reasonable name. Nitrogen, non-metal, hydrogen, non-metal. So this is gonna be a molecular compound as well. Um, and you might recognize this, this is ammonia. And this is a common name. So we just sort of commonly call this ammonia just because we run into it a lot. But if we wanted to name it using our naming convention, we would write nitrogen trihydride. So we're not writing mononitrogen because typically if it's the first thing, we would just sort of leave that off. It would be assumed that it's mononitride or mononitrogen. Um, but if you wrote that in, that's fine as well. So nitrogen trihydride tri because there's three of these hydrogens um, and we're changing the ending to hydride. Uh, again, this is a molecular compound. Let's do the next one. K2SO4, this is an ionic compound. Potassium here is a positive one charged ion. Uh, it is a metal. And then SO4, SO4 is right here, sulfate. SO4 two minus sulfate. So this is gonna be a metal plus a polyatomic ion, and that's gonna be, it is ionic. If I wanted to name this, I'm gonna just name this potassium sulfate. And I'm writing just potassium sulfate here. I don't need to write dipotassium, again, because it's ionic. I'm only gonna use the di, tri, penta thing for molecular compounds. As a reader, you could read potassium sulfate. You know that it's K for potassium, and sulfate is SO4 and it always has a two minus charge. So therefore you need to say, well, to balance this out, right, this whole thing needs to have an overall neutral charge. So it's gonna, I'm gonna need two of these potassiums for every one of the sulfates. All right, let's look at um, going the other way. So let's, let's scoot this down and let's look at dinitrogen trioxide. Dinitrogen trioxide, uh, right away I can see that that's gonna be a molecular compound. So nitrogen and oxygen, combining those, both non-metals, molecular compound. Dinitrogen, so N2O3 for trioxide. Let's do the next one. Nitrogen, nitrogen is a diatomic gas. So if I find nitrogen in you know, nature, it's gonna be in the N2 form. So for our diatomic gases, uh, let's scoot this down. The diatomic gases are gonna be hydrogen, if we find hydrogen in nature, it's gonna be H2. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. So just going down, um, you know, drawing like a little seven here, N-O-F-C-L-B-R-I. Those will all be our um, uh, diatomic gases, there we go. Let's do the next one, lithium acetate. So lithium, that's a metal. Acetate, what is acetate? So let's look at our list of polyatomic ions. And I see acetate here, CH3CO2 with a minus charge. So if I wanted to write the molecular formula, lithium, it's got a plus one charge, and then CH3CO2, it's got a minus one charge overall. So if I just write it like this, that's totally sufficient. You might wanna put parentheses around it, that's, that's fine as well, to indicate that this is a, sort of a polyatomic ion. And this is gonna be an ionic compound, right? A metal plus a non-metal or polyatomic ion. Let's just do one more, phosphorus trifluoride. So phosphorus is P, and then trifluoride F3. This is gonna be a molecular compound. The last one I'm gonna do on this video here is vanadium five oxide. And what's really interesting about this is now we're seeing this Roman numeral thing. So what's the deal with that? 
The Roman numeral thing, that comes into play when we're talking about transition metals. So here I've got a box around my transition metals, and here I've got vanadium. It's within that box. It is a transition metal. So these transition metals, like I said before, they're going to have variable charges. Sometimes they'll be plus one, sometimes they'll be plus two, sometimes whatever. Each of these individual ions can have more than one you know, form, essentially. So if we're using or dealing with these transition metals, we need to be told what the charge on that vanadium is. So this is telling us that that vanadium has a plus five charge. So I'm going to have this vanadium, it's going to have a plus five charge. I'm going to pair that up with oxygen, which has a two minus charge. So each of these oxygen atoms is going to have a minus two charge. Each of this vanadium atoms is going to have a plus five charge. And I need to figure out how to balance those out. The easiest way for me to balance that out is to have V2O5, right? This is going to be an ionic compound because I've got a metal plus a non-metal. And this balancing out of V2O5, vanadium, we're told, is have, has a five plus charge. <clears throat> and oxygen, we know, has a minus two charge. So going back to our periodic table, if I've got group seven, right? So this is group seven, this is group eight, and this is group six. If I've got a group seven ion, if, well, if we're talking about this as an ionic compound, things in group seven will have a minus one charge, and things in group six will have a minus two charge, always. So if I had got oxygen in an ionic compound, that oxygen will have a minus two charge, and I need to balance this whole thing out, right? This whole thing will have an overall neutral charge, therefore I'm gonna need two vanadiums plus 10 overall positive charges, five oxygens minus 10 overall negative charges, so overall this thing will balance out neutrally charged. Okay, if you have any questions about this, let me know, uh, and I will try to clear them up.